Fundamental Rights Agency, supported by Croatia and by Norway. I'm your host, Imogen Folks, and what we're going to do today is learn about and then discuss the latest groundbreaking survey from the Fundamental Rights Agency on attitudes to human rights in the European Union. Tens of thousands of people were surveyed, some very surprising, interesting findings to come. What we're going to do first is hear from the director of the Fundamental Rights Agency, Michael O'Flaherty. Imogen, thank you very much indeed. Uh, uh, and uh, thank you for the introduction. Um, for years now, dear friends, uh, we've been talking about this health, the situation of human rights in our societies, to what extent they grip people, to what extent they're at the heart of what we see as important for the well-being of ourselves, our families, our neighbors, and everybody else. Sometimes the speculation about the status of human rights in our societies uh, is, is, very, is, is very negative. Uh, the view that they don't matter anymore. And sometimes even these views are instrumentalized by people who try to undermine values and human rights. Uh, this is very serious. It's very important to address this because it, um, it puts at threat the system that has guaranteed peace uh, across our countries since the Second World War. That's the reason for the Fundamental Rights Agency taking on this survey. We went out and we asked rights holders what they think, what their views are about their rights, your rights, my rights, uh, their attitudes to different groups in society, and indeed the levels of confidence they have in those bits of the state uh, that roll out and guarantee rights. We asked 35,000 people in 29 countries. It's the first survey of its kind, at least on a regional level, that's been ever attempted in the world. It's a very deep, very wide survey. It asks very many questions, for which reason there are multiple roll rollouts of the data. Today, obviously, is the highlight, and I'll come back to that in just a moment, but just to give you a sense of, of some of the other um, activities. Uh, already in the context of our monthly public uh, bulletins on COVID and fundamental rights, uh, we introduce data on attitudes to privacy in the context, obviously, of the development of contact tracing apps. Last week at a virtual event, uh, I presented evidence from the survey on attitudes to Muslims in our societies. And I have to say that the, uh, the evidence wasn't very reassuring. And coming up, in the in coming weeks and months, uh, we will present evidence on attitudes to Roma, on the experience of being a victim of crime, on the knowledge out there in society of where to go with your complaints, uh, the role of national human rights institutions, as well as uh, attitudes to artificial intelligence and big data and how that impacts our lives. But let me come right back to today uh, at this point, and let me begin by warmly thanking the Croatian presidency, as well as the EEA Norway grants for partnering us for this event. We began the partnership anticipating a live event in Brussels. Uh, that had to change, but Croatia and the EEA Norway grants have stayed with us all the way, and we're most grateful. I'd also like to thank the distinguished panelists today and tomorrow for giving us their time. The um, let me give you some headlines from the evidence we'll produce today. This really is at the heart of the survey. It's about the fundamental attitudes to rights and levels of trust in the state. And I would suggest that the first headline is a good one. It's a very encouraging one. I think to our surprise, we discovered that human rights matter to nine in 10 of our general population. That's more, I think, than we might have expected. Nine in 10 of our 35,000 respondents said that human rights are essential for the well being of society. Perhaps even more surprising, nearly eight out of 10 of all of those respondents have heard of either the Universal Declaration of Human Rights or the European Convention on Human Rights. Now, working in human rights, I've never expected that people need to know the name of treaties. They just need to get their rights guaranteed. But that so many know the names of these fundamental uh, uh, treaties is, I think, remarkable and encouraging. So we've got a great base. But as my colleagues will present uh, 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 this morning, uh, 
if you drill down into the figures, we also have some worrying situations. For instance, the, 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 the stats vary dramatically from country to country. Second, and I don't think this is surprising, but it's very serious. There's a very evident link between your trust in, belief in human rights and your socioeconomic status. Or to put it another way, the poorer and more marginal you are, the less likely you are to believe that human rights are delivering for you and for society. We also have a disturbingly large number of people, varying around 50% in some cases, who say that, yeah, human rights are important, but they're important for somewhere else, for another country, uh, or for somebody else, not for me, but for somebody else. And uh, I'm afraid we found echoed with evidence in our survey, what we already knew anecdotally, that a lot of people complain that human rights is just for bad people. Uh, again, you, you, you just have to pick up a newspaper to get this attitude reflected, but I'm afraid we've confirmed it through the survey. So that brings me then a, in conclusion of my opening remarks uh, to some suggestions on how we can go forward. In the first place, uh, we at the Fundamental Rights Agency would urge everybody out there who cares about human rights, be you a decision maker, be you in civil society, use the survey, drill it down country by country, issue by issue. It'll give you an enormous agenda uh, for action uh, as we go forward. And second, and this is by far and away the most important thing I could suggest today, we've got to show that if we say human rights is for everybody, then we have to allow human rights to deliver for everybody. Mm -hmm. Uh, and that right now uh, shines a light on uh, socioeconomic justice, on tackling poverty and tackling uh, the exclusion of so many people from well-being in our society. And so we need our decision makers to put a new light, a new focus, a new emphasis on socioeconomic justice. And in doing that, they need to name the human rights that lie behind the action. Yes, work for housing, work for jobs, work for healthcare, but frame it as delivering on the human rights to housing, the human rights to healthcare, and so forth. That brings me then uh, to uh, the third suggestion, which is that we've got to encourage our political leadership to talk up for human rights. Political leaders in the 1950s talked up for human rights. They declared it as being the heart of the peacemaking agenda. We need to find that energy again. And when our leaders talk about human rights with passion and conviction, then that will filter through across our societies. And the final suggestion I would make this morning is that we need to invest in, frankly, a more literate media when it comes to human rights. We read too many lazy, easy stories about human rights that, that ride on some of those problems I've identified in society just to sell the paper or whatever else. And that's got to stop. We have to invest in working with media to upskill journalists uh, so that they can use the vocabulary and the tools of human rights to tell the necessary stories. But let me leave it there. I look forward very much to, to the proceedings today, to listening to our panelists. Thank you all of you who are with us online uh, uh, for joining uh, in this event. And let's continue to work together to build the world of which we can be proud. Thank you. Michael O'Flaherty, thank you very much for those words and stay with us because when we get to the panel debate, I'm sure you may, you may have uh, additions to make to that. We're going to hear now from Croatia, currently holding the presidency of the EU Council. We've got a welcoming message from the Croatian Foreign Minister, Gordon Gerlich Radman. Ladies and gentlemen, distinguished participants, it's a great pleasure to greet you at the beginning of today's conference, what do rights mean for people in the EU, in the capacity of the Croatian Presidency of the Council of the EU. I would like to thank the Agency for launching this video conference and giving us the possibility to reflect on the pro perception of fundamental rights of citizens in the European Union, Member States and in North Macedonia. The research is very informative and useful as it reveals the EU citizens' thoughts, concerns and opinions on human rights issues. Their ideas should serve as guidance to all policy makers on how to improve human rights policies. The EU is the most progressive advocate and guardian of human rights, 
However, since human rights are an extremely broad area, we might not always be aware of the gaps in their implementation. Crises like recent COVID-19 bring additional challenges in this respect. In this sense, the results of this research will provide a valuable insight and suggest measures to overcome those gaps. I strongly believe that the agency findings might come useful to many policymakers in the European Union and beyond. I want to thank you all, the organizers and the participants of this virtual conference and wish you fruitful and successful discussions over the next two days. Thank you. Thank you very much, Foreign Minister, for those kind words. Time now to introduce our panel guests, where we're going to unpick some of the findings in that survey. We have with us uh, Joanne Goody, who is Fundamental Rights Agency's Head of Research and Data. We have Laura Vidovic, uh, Ombudswoman for Human Rights from Croatia, Alexander Alexandra Dolcevic, who is the mayor of Gdansk in Poland, and Steve Hayward, general manager of Edelman, CEO and general manager of Edelman. Um, I want to, before I actually put questions to you, just remind everybody of some of the key findings, because they are surprising, things we might find unexpected. We've prepared a little video just highlighting some of the key findings. It takes just about a minute. We'll run that now, now, and then we will start to digging into what they actually mean. Right. Um, sorry about that. We've got some technical problems. We'll go straight into the debate. Luckily, Joanne Goody, we've got you here, um, so you can highlight some of the, the findings for us. Um, First of all, maybe a bit of the background to the survey, and then just tell us the key findings, the key percentages that we should perhaps be concerned about. Okay, a bit of the background to the survey in terms of like, why did we decide to do this survey? As uh, our director, Michael LaFlarity pointed out earlier, it's the first time that the Fundamental Rights Agency has actually surveyed the general population. Typically, we've surveyed uh, minorities, groups that are particularly vulnerable to rights abuses in the EU, like ethnic minorities, immigrants, the Jewish community. So we've decided to, for the first time, do a comprehensive survey of the general population. One of the reasons we did that is because there is a certain level of skepticism that we've seen increasing in recent years among some quarters concerning, if you like, the utility and the relevance of fundamental rights. Uh, and so FRA decided it was very much time to embrace this discourse of rights on our own terms and to do this by reflecting the opinions and the experiences of 35,000 people. So it's very much a bottom up perspective from people about their understanding and experience of fundamental rights. And what it does, the survey, is it very much complements existing mechanisms uh, to report on fundamental rights from international organizations or NGOs and civil society. So these are very established mechanisms. And this is the first time we thought the Fundamental Rights Agency actually brings fundamental rights uh, experiences from the people to this debate. Uh, and just to underline that it, we thought it's very important in these times to have robust empirical evidence that is brought to discussions and to have fundamental rights in our own terms addressed using evidence uh, from the ground. In terms of some of the key findings uh, which you asked me uh, to, to highlight here, I mean the report is fairly long. Those of you taking part in the discussion today will have received it. It covers three broad areas. So what do people think and know about human rights? We referred to human rights seldom uh, in the questions and we made them tangible and real to people. And then we had questions about people's views on the functioning of society, looking at those pillars that should uphold our rights. And then we looked to asking questions in a third section about access to and information about rights, focusing on public services. And the findings can be broken down at the EU and the member state level. As my director said, there are some very positive findings in our survey. And one I'd like to highlight again is that nine in 10 people 
in the EU think that human rights are important for creating a fairer society. So nine in 10. This result was consistent across all the member states. It never fell below 76% for any individual member state. We can take heart from that result. But the resounding message across all the questions we asked, and you will see it when you look in the report, is that for virtually every single question, those who struggle to make ends meet in their daily lives, the unemployed, older respondents, those who experience severe limitations in their everyday life because of health or disability, those who have a lower of level of education, the so-called, if you like, socioeconomically disadvantaged, they are consistently less likely to feel that human rights benefit them and are for them. And this is a significant group in our societies. And if I just highlight one result there in that regard, for example, the extent of the differences between social economic groups are really stark. So, for example, 44 percent of people who find it difficult to make ends meet agree with the following statement that the only people to benefit from human rights are those who don't deserve them, such as criminals and terrorists. So 44 percent of people. Um, who struggle to make ends meet agree with that statement. In juxtaposition, 27% of people who are cope very well on their income, they agree with that statement. So if you're well off, if you're doing fine, 27% say, I agree that only criminals and terrorists benefit from human rights. 44% of those struggling agree with that statement. This is, this is worrying. Um, just very briefly then, gender. We looked into gender differences. There weren't many gender differences, which is also, I think, reassuring. Only a few. But tomorrow's discussion will highlight some gender differences on data protection. But a striking finding for us was really also in relation to age. We see a significant difference between younger respondents, the 16 to 29-year-olds, and the older age groups. And this is something that maybe we can come back to later. But stark differences with age and some big surprises there. We can see, for example, young people in comparison with older groups consistently attach a lower level of importance to the six aspects of functioning democratic societies in comparison with older age groups. They attach low importance to these basic principles of functioning democratic societies. But on the other hand, they very much support principles of fairer society. They very much embrace that. Uh, so I'll stop it there because there's a lot I can go into, but I know um, the report is rich and I can come back to those points later. Thanks, Joanne. Very, very interesting. Some standout findings for me there. Heartening, nine out of 10 think human rights are important to a functioning democratic society. Worrying, and Laura Vidovich, I want to ask you this, worrying that people on lower incomes who struggle day to day, month to month to pay their bills, think that they are not benefiting from human rights. It doesn't really apply to them. And that sometimes maybe people they perceive to be undeserving criminals do benefit. You're, a, you're an ombudswoman. Um, how do you address that? How do, how do you engage people? There are, of course, many ways. But just to maybe cross-reference this um, two sets of results, so I'm saying ten, uh, uh, nine out of ten are aware of the human rights and that human rights matter to them. And at the same time, they believe it's only for for criminals. And well, if you add to, to that line also migrants in, in some of our societies, I think the results would be even stronger. Um, probably it might be because for those um, poor amongst us, human rights are so far only a theoretical concept. Um, it, probably also because we haven't done enough uh, in communicating what human rights actually are for them and how to deliver them. But let me please just start by saying that I want to congratulate Fra and, and thank you for, for this survey. I think it's extremely useful. It, um, it will help us enormously in the future to, to try to build up on it and to advocate even better. And I'm saying that because the results that we've heard and, and read so far are not that surprising. Um, to the large extent, I'd say that they actually confirm what we've been reporting for years already, that there's huge mistrust in the system and in the decision makers 
that there's lack of awareness of what human rights are and, and how to claim them. Uh, and that people don't really feel equal before the law. And we see that from the complaints we receive every year. We, see, we saw that from a survey that we had in, in 2016 that showed that 68% of those that experienced discrimination did not report it. And mind you, in Croatia, socioeconomic uh, status is a ground of the discrimination. And we see that through the field work. I think it's enormously important to, to just go to the villages, to the remote homes of people and to talk to them, to learn to listen better, to be able to address their fears and to understand their real situation. There's lack of infrastructure, there's lack of um, social services, even health services. And those are all human rights. But as Michael said, we need to learn to frame them within the human rights scope so that people can actually learn how to claim them. Thank you very much, Laura. Alexandra, I'd, I'd like to come to you now. Um, you're an elected official, mayor of Gdansk. One of the key findings in this report was that many people, up to 80%, although there's a geographic spread across Europe, think that politicians in mainstream parties are just not interested, don't care about them. What's your reaction to that? I mean, do you think, as Laura said, that maybe there's a, a more serious job of communicating and above all, listening to be, to be done, to get people engaged? Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, best regards from Gdansk, city of solidarity and freedom. Uh, nowadays, I really do think that the world uh, where solidarity is more and more important also when uh, taking into consideration the topic of our today discussion and this uh, and the survey and this this research uh, unfortunately yes you are right uh, people are disappointed with the uh, with the um, political parties but not only political parties but also with the um, most of um, central administration, uh, public, um, public and uh, government uh, regarding their uh, rights, human rights. Uh, therefore, mm, not so many cities, but every single year more and more uh, cities, local municipalities, uh, regions uh, are taking um, um, are taking different actions uh, in order to uh, make uh, the um, our societies more and more aware of the fact um, of the rights uh, they have. And for example, in uh, in my city, uh, we uh, step by step try to engage more and more people into public engagement, public discussions, but also participatory uh, budget uh, every single year. Uh, also, we have advi advi advisory councils um, for seniors, for young people, uh, for different groups of people, which is extremely important. I am perfectly, perfectly aware of the fact that um, we can't do anything just like that, just like in one month or one year, because this is a permanent action, permanent activity, education, uh, step by step. Um, well, in every single country, uh, this is uh, organized in a different way. But I deeply believe that the mm, role of the local leaders, uh, which are openly mm, uh, standing for the fundamental rights, uh, like in Poland, also for the democracy, uh, for rule of law, uh, of course, human rights, uh, equality, uh, and so on and so on is also an important example um, for other people, other local leaders, but also um, not, not only uh, those who are in public uh, local governments, but also for local um, activists. On the other hand, what we are doing in my city, in the city of Gdansk, we are uh, permanently 
giving a chance uh, to my staff, to people working in a, uh, in a um, city of Gdansk, in a city council, uh, to make them more aware uh, of the fact uh, that people could be different. I know that this is um, something that nowadays in 2020, 21st century, uh, is sometimes not very obvious. And it, it has different grounds, different backgrounds, coming back from our past, coming back from our homes, for, uh, from our um, upbringing, and so on and so on. But I deeply believe that not fighting, but also but giving the example, showing the way, uh, education, uh, and so on and so on is very important. And we have very uh, concrete programs, uh, politics uh, in our city. For example, um, uh, in vitro program, which probably, you know, in Poland uh, was uh, abolished by Polish uh, government from the national level. Only local communities are uh, running this uh, in vitro uh, program uh, for the people. For example, we have equality model which was uh, adopted by the city council. But uh, what is the most important, it was prepared uh, during the long uh, discussion, long uh, process together with the non-governmental organizations, activists, and so on and so on. So this is not the program which was uh, found here in a political cabinet of mayor of the city or in a city council, but which was prepared together with um, with the different uh, different um, uh, organization, which is uh, more important because it's a real program. And nowadays, step by step, we are trying to change the awareness of people. Um, and uh, I think that we can see the results, but we need to be uh, very um, consequent and it's a constant work um, which cannot be stopped. Thank, Thank you, you very much, uh, Alexandra. Steve, what do you think of what you've heard so far? I mean, there seems to be quite an interesting split, almost opposing viewpoints in this survey. About half of people in the European Union think that human rights abuses happen elsewhere. Um, and also, only about half of them think that protecting minority rights is important, even though there are many, many surveys, and, and, and Joanna actually mentioned some at the beginning, that uh, discrimination still of different groups still does happen in Europe. Yeah, thank you. I, th I think it's a really good question. I think what you see from that data is some quite interesting insights into the experience of general population and their, and their views around these kind of seemingly conflicting issues. And, and I think that the when we talk about how to respond to that, um, it, it's very much a case that there is an important response from government and from NGOs, we've heard already. But um, what I also miss is the kind of pillar of response from the institution of business. But I think that's a really critical part of unifying the response and helping to engage all diverse members of, the, of local communities um, to address some of these issues and to build that sense of kind of greater understanding and perhaps appreciation for the challenges that um, some minorities face. And a really interesting um, piece of research that uh, I read recently from, from the Edelman's Trust Barometer, which looks into di different dimensions of trust, is that 60% of respondents globally expected brands to step up and to respond to the recent um, sort of conversation and protests around racial injustice. And so I think there's like an untapped kind of level of interest and um, appetite for engagement from a whole other pillar of society here, which we can also kind of tap into, and that can really help to accelerate and turbocharge the response from government and from NGOs, but kind of unifying that together. Thanks very much. In fact, I want to come back to that point, but, but I'm told we can now play that video, which is worth it because we will see some more of the key findings, which I want to unpick in the course of this debate. So technical people, you are invisible to me, but I'm sure you're pressing the button. Please press it now. What do people in Europe really think about human rights? In 2019, the EU Agency for Fundamental Rights undertook a major survey 
and asked 35,000 people from 29 countries about their views on fundamental rights. Nine in ten of you agree human rights are important for creating a fairer society. Nine in ten. More than three in five of you do think human rights can play a useful role in your lives. Should we be concerned? The following answers reveal some stark differences in what people think about human rights. 68% of you think some people take unfair advantage of human rights. 68%. But only 27% of you who are better off think this. And 27% of you think judges in Europe are not independent. 27. And you? Do you really think this is acceptable? Let's think about those figures. Let's use them for protecting our fundamental rights for building a fairer society. So, uh, there we have it. Um, some interesting findings there. Um, Joanne, just coming to, to, to you again now, we heard Steve talking about kind of untapped resource uh, with, with business. Do you, is that something, did you, did you do anything in the survey about this? Because the other side of the coin, of course, is that um, business has an increasing, perhaps possibly unchecked, unsurveyed influence on our lives. Yes, it's one of the areas we will cover a little bit in tomorrow's discussion. But what I can say is that we did look at elements in terms of people's trust in the state and then people's trust in the private sector when it came to sharing, say, uh, data online. So trust in relation to privacy issues was very much addressed. But coming back to what Steve just said in relation to trust, I mean, one thing we did look at in the third section of, of the report, I mean, we look at public services, which are there to deliver rights in practice on the ground. So public services are not something that should be abstracted from people's lives. They're about delivering uh, rights in practice. And when we looked at the results from our own survey and we correlated them uh, with some results from some other research, we found a clear relationship that I can say was statistically significant. It's not happening by chance. It's a message that can go through to people is that countries where there's higher levels of trust in public services also have citizens who really demand more from those services. Now, if countries have lower levels of trust in public services, then the question rises, do they then turn to the private sector? Do they then turn to civil society? So that's a kind of conundrum when you're delivering on rights uh, about the ability of the public services to actually deliver and whether the public trusts them. And if they don't trust them, where they have high expectations and high trust they go together, but where they don't trust public services, do they then turn elsewhere? Does the state not deliver on the rights that they should be protecting? Steve, you have your hand up. What's your sure. response to that? Yeah, I, I just, I think, Joe, that's a fun, that's a really interesting way of phrasing the question. And, and I, I kind of, in one hand, really agree with the premise. And in the other, there's something I miss a little bit in that, which is, is, is there an opportunity for um, business to partner with the public sector to deliver some of those solutions. So rather than thinking about citizens turning away from government, and I fully understand and agree with what your point around kind of that lower demand and building that capacity and that expectation amongst citizens. So they demand more from um, their governments and from those that are there to serve them. I think that's a phenomenally important point. And I, and I guess the, the flip side of that is what role can business then play in helping to deliver that? And I, I don't mean so much in the sense of a traditional partnership, but more actually a bit more of a humble partnership where business recognises that it can't do it all, in, particularly in terms of ethics and trust. And there is a huge role for regulation, ethics and trust there for the public sector. But public sector perhaps recognises where business has its strengths it can bring to that too in terms of delivery and performance. Joanne, I know you had your hand up, but I also saw before that Alexandra nodding, and I would be very interested to see from, from the mayoral point of view, what do you see um, as, as, as worthwhile in, in Steve's idea of partnerships with business? 
Oh, I'm not quite sure if you can hear me. Um, yes, I can. All right. Um, thank you very much for mention mentioning this. Um, actually, um, in my region, in my metropolitan area uh, of Gdansk, just like, I don't know, two or three months ago, we agreed uh, together not only public services, but also um, uh, the private sector. Uh, the biggest companies um, were... Uh, Plenty of foreigners um, are uh, working. That how important is to work together to feel all those people here in the Gdansk in Pomeranian region like at home. That this is not only deal of public uh, service, not only deal of healthcare and so on and so on. This is also um, let's let's call it an interest but also an interest in a moral sense uh, of uh, private sector. Therefore, I perfectly agree that this all must be arranged together, public-private sector uh, for uh, inclusion, integration uh, of people, not only immigrants, of course, but uh, to feel people uh, that they're all wanted. Laura, you have an input there? You need to unmute yourself. This is the, the perils yeah. of virtual virtual debate. I'm I'm thinking out loud, and uh, there is a slight disagreement that I feel with some of the things that I've heard. And of course, I haven't read all of the results in the survey, so I'm not quite sure what what do you mean by business and and private providers of social services, and whether that is the same thing or not. But if we talk about the poor and the marginalized and sometimes or often those would be at least in Croatia um, ones that live in remote areas and outside of the of the biggest cities if the public service is not available to them if there's no social services if they need to travel to see the doctor for 50 kilometers or more um, they don't have private services to go to instead because they can't afford private services. I mean, even sometimes uh, those that we would call middle class or, or like high school educated probably cannot afford to go uh, to, to private uh, service providers. Uh, so just to simply to, to connect that and to um, think that because public services are not there to address the needs of those who need it doesn't mean that the private sector will do it because, of course, they need to be invested in as well. I think it is about investment in social services if we want to respond to, to those socioeconomic issues that, that people feel and that have expressed through the survey. It's the responsibility of the public sector and of the state. Uh, and then others can contribute, of course, but primarily I think it needs to be regulated. Joanna, your response, because you did have your hand up. Well, just to say, I mean, also Fra has done separate work on business and human rights. Uh, so it's an area we do look at is business and human rights. But I think uh, picking up on what Laura's just said, I mean, of course, from a fundamental rights perspective, the key responsibility of the state to deliver to those who are most in need to ensure that their rights uh, are protected. And so the results from the survey again and again are showing that the most socioeconomic deprived are saying that it's not getting through to them, either mm. some of the messaging or the access to certain public services, which we can see in the results from the survey. Steve, you had your hand up. Just yeah, no, just 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 to build on that, Joe. I think I think um, it, that that that's exactly right. And if there's the one part as Laura mentioned around um, sort of delivery and those really the essential kind of delivery of those fundamental human rights and access to healthcare, access to um, sort of social welfare net and, and framework. And I think the other side of that question around why do half of respondents not think this is of high importance is around kind of inspiring and driving change and driving a sea change in society. And I think that's also an area where not to be a broken record but it's important to think about the role that business or perhaps even a slightly even more dirty word of brands and branding 
can can pull into that because effective communication and inspiring communication with hard to reach audiences I, I would say is something that is not on, again only in the domain of the public sector it's one where we can think a bit more around partnership and how to reach that so less on the delivery side and more on that inspiration and driving cultural change side Okay, thank you very much. Now, what I wanted to tell you is that in addition to your input, we have asked different people across Europe, human rights activists, elected officials, public figures, to also respond to the findings of this survey. We've got some reactions from them here on video, which we can look at and then discuss uh, going forward for the second part of the panel. Very interesting, some of the responses here. So before we continue the discussion, let's take a look at what they have to say. A finding I found challenging, if not surprising, in the Fundamental Rights Agency survey is that a full third of Europeans believe that the only people who benefit from human rights are those who don't deserve them, such as criminals or terrorists, and that that number goes up to 44% amongst those who find it difficult to make ends meet. To me, that illustrates a fundamental failing in terms of how we've engaged with people around rights. We need to move beyond legal abstractions to really illustrate in concrete terms that human rights are the lifeblood of our day-to-day -day existences, that they're the backbone of our jobs, of our housing, of our education, and that they're part of what's keeping us safe during this pandemic. That a rights-respecting society is one that will afford greater benefits for all people and their children going forward, that it will make us all safer and more secure even when those rights are being afforded to people who are accused of crimes or accused of terrorism. To me, the most striking finding of this report is the perceived discrepancy between human rights ideals and political practice and implementation. Nearly nine out of 10 people in the EU find that human rights are important for creating fairer societies, whereas six out of 10 people find that politicians do not care about them. And this perception is all the more prevalent among the socially disadvantaged. This points to a need for politicians in the EU to better demonstrate their commitment to human dignity, equality, and non-discrimination, not least in socioeconomic terms. The socioeconomic impact of the pandemic recent protests against racism also here in the EU, as well as the urgent need to shift the global economy towards sustainability, points to an urgent need for us all to overcome the discrepancies that this report points to. Judiciary is one of the three pillars of a democratic state. Executive power, legislative power, and judiciary have to control each other without dominating each other. However, it's a fact that the legislative power and executive power have become more intertwined and the executive power has grown. This brings with it an imbalance. It is now an alarming signal to read that one out of four EU citizens has the impression that a judge rarely or never does a job out of influence from the government. This not only shows lack of trust, but also a lack of structural independence of our systems, not only in those systems which are anyway in the spotlight, unfortunately. We have to stand up to protect our independence, we have to stand up to disclose structural deficits, and we have to stand up for our European colleagues in need. My major concern with the results of this year's Fundamental Rights Survey is about political intimidation and independence of the judiciary. The results are striking. 21% of the people in the European Union think that NGOs and charities are never or rarely able to do their work free from government intimidation. And 27% believe that judges are never able to do their job free from government influence. The findings of the survey fully support our observations from the past several years in my own country, Bulgaria, and in several other East European states. 
The EU should take these unfortunate developments very seriously and should deal with them through a series of monitoring, legislative and financial measures. Europe cannot take pride of its democratic culture and promote it outside of its borders if it is unable to address these serious problems within member states. What I find important about this research is that it confirms that society isn't just divided into two groups of people who are pro-human rights and anti-human rights. What the research results suggest is that actually a lot of people have conflicting views about human rights. Sometimes they're in favour of human rights and sometimes they're against them. And this group actually seems to be the biggest group in society. We need to do two things about this. First, we need to find out much more about this movable middle. How is it that they think about human rights? What is it that they are worried about? And the second thing that we need to do is to learn to communicate much more effectively than we are at the moment. So we need to know how to speak about human rights in a way that resonates with people's values. Authoritarians have been doing this very effectively for quite a number of years. We need to play catch up. There to our survey, I want to dig a little deeper into the findings and actually come to you, Joanna, because two of the things that stood out to me were, despite the fact nine out of 10 people believe human rights are fundamental, they're also looking at the society around them and thinking, but it's not, it's still not that fair. People think it, that it's, they may have to, or that it's acceptable to give a gift. I mean, the short word for that would be bribe a public official if they need something. Others feel that the judiciary is not independent from politics. Could you tell us a bit more about that? Okay. I mean, you mentioned, uh, for want of a better word, low-level corruption. So uh, this is something we did ask about in the survey. Um, because when we asked about people's experience of public services, we thought it's very important to capture some of the problems, if I put it like that, that they encounter. Um, when I looked at the results on people's experience of public services, and um, we dug down in some of the results, uh, there are some worrying results in this regard. So in relation to public services, I mean, uh, first of all, we ask people when it comes to looking uh, at public services with corruption and age, thankfully, people's actual experiences of corruption were very low. You're seeing a slide now. I think you can see it on acceptability of giving a gift or doing a favor. These are on people's attitudes towards low level corruption about the um, acceptability of giving a gift or doing a favor for public official or civil servant if you need something doing urgently. And hopefully you can all see that on your screen now, that particular slide. So what we see here is quite worrying results uh, across the EU about people's attitudes towards so-called low level corruption. Thankfully, and I'm not showing that slide now, but thankfully uh, people did not actually experience corruption at very high levels. It was around 4% across the EU. So actual experiences were low, but attitudes about acceptability of corruption were high. However, having said that, in some member states, it went up to one in five people saying that they'd experienced low level corruption. So I think there's a worrying result in that regard is that attitudes uh, are very... Um, if I put it loose towards corruption. I'm going to show you one more slide. Now, this slide gave us some surprising results. We're talking again about people's attitudes, the acceptability of giving a gift to or doing a favor for a public official or civil servant if you need something urgently. This is a breakdown by the age groups. What we can see here, and this thing is particularly um, worrying, is that the younger age groups, the 16 to 29 year olds, think that this is acceptable sometimes or always. So that's why I said like, the beginning of this uh, debate is that we have to break down the results, not at just the EU level, the member state level of what is going on with specific groups. In the older age groups, you see their uh, lower levels of acceptance of, of low level corruption. And one final thing I'll just leave with you with um, here, and it's very relevant in 
the situation we're living in now with COVID, we also ask people about public services delivering. And we ask them whether they think it is common that a person needs to give a gift or do someone a favour in three situations, to obtain a driver's licence, to register land or property, or to receive better treatment in a public hospital. Of those three scenarios, the need to give a gift or do a favour to get um, better service was highest in relation to public health. So 35% of respondents said this happens at least sometimes, that they have to do a favour or give a gift to get better treatment in a public hospital. Um, now, we asked this question in the survey pre-COVID, but I think, of course, it's highly relevant in the times we're living in now. And I think when you dig down into these results, uh, some worrying findings emerge and we need to tackle them straight on. Uh, so I'll stop there. That's what really surprised me in relation to, you said corruption, but public services and delivering on them. Thank you very much, Joanna. That's a quite illuminating. It's a question to both Alexandra and Laura. If people think it's, it's acceptable to bribe a public official to, to, uh, to get what they want, I mean, is this a perception? Are they all imagining it or, or, or is it actually happening? I mean, I don't know if that's not a question you want to answer, yeah. but if it's a perception, it's one you need to tackle, surely. Of course, and it, it's the debate we had last year and beginning of this year in Croatia regarding judiciary, because the EU Justice Scoreboard showed that Croatia scored worse when it comes to the perception of judiciary. And then the, the justice, um, uh, the, the judiciary people tried to argue that it's only the perception, that the real situation is totally different. Um, and it's very difficult to, to answer to that, but probably the, the situation is somewhere, the real answer is somewhere in the middle, in the beginning. Um, but this survey also shows that while 27% of people EU think the judges never or rarely do the job independently from the government in Croatia, that percentage is 47. Um, that really confirms um, also from our complaints, uh, judiciary is always top three in the number of the complaints that we receive throughout the years uh, and the health, whether it's the right of patients, health insurance or different health issues uh, for the last uh, two years has been also in the top three of the areas in which we receive the most complaints. Um, there is a message in it for, for uh, um, well, health sector, I'd say also social sector, it's not that different, uh, but judiciary as well in investing more in the human resources, but also in infrastructure, in communicating better, in educating, speaking of the judiciary, of course, in, in Croatia, mostly in, when it comes to the EU law, uh, much more needs to be uh, um, invested. Alexandra. Well, um, coming back to the uh, survive, but just in a few words, I would like to comment on this uh, judiciary situation. Probably, as you know, um, in Poland, we have um, a really serious situation um, coming back to independence of the Supreme Court uh, and the judges uh, themselves. And the numbers which are in this uh, survive are, are, are um, for Poland as such that um, together, never and sometimes, it's together 63% uh, people thinking that the judges do their job free from government influence. And this is something which uh, for me is a shocking number, but showing that the situation in Poland concerning uh, courts, judiciary, uh, is really, really serious. Um, and uh, I'm really glad that the European Union uh, institutions uh, are um, also treating the situation seriously. But coming back to the figures uh, showed by uh, Joanna, uh, well, I'm glad that in Poland, this number of uh, people thinking that giving uh, gifts to the public services will help with their um, own situation is 
uh, getting down. Uh, but this is um, something what was really shocking for me, uh, the age of people uh, that the young people think uh, that the biggest number of, of young people uh, was those um, uh, that was this group, uh, which is thinking that this is the way to um, for better treatment. Uh, once again, I deeply believe in education, education, and education. Um, uh, again, giving good uh, good examples uh, and good proposals. Thank you. Steve, could I ask you, I'm quite interested in this, this generational split, is that more young people think that it's uh, acceptable maybe to offer a, a bribe or, or have doubts about the independence of the judiciary. Is that, and Joanna, you maybe you also, you want to come in here, but I'm wondering, is that just uh, rebellious youth or are they, are they literally more disadvantaged than older generations? Yeah, I, th I think that's a uh, re really interesting question. And I guess w one part of that is, uh, as we talked about before, what, what is the reality versus what is the perception? But it's you know very fair to say that we're living in exceptionally um, volatile times. And you know I think you have seen over the last sort of decade or so, uh, a lot of kind of narratives evolving around what is the opportunity for um, youth. And you see that in sort of the victims of the global global financial crisis and then beyond you know what does what has that meant in terms of limiting opportunity what does this mean in terms of intergenerational fairness and I, I've actually been fascinated over the last sort of three or four months to see how little um, that conversation about intergenerational fairness has emerged when looking at the public health dimensions of COVID um, and I think that that's really interesting because I think there may be a st something that's a little stored up there too in terms of a uh, communication and perception challenge for um, sort of yeah protecting human rights in the, in the period ahead because um, we will pr perhaps look back on this time a little bit how we look back on the global financial crisis and think about who has been the uh, yeah the, the recipient of the misfortune in terms of the economic impact and I appreciate eco economic impact is just one of the many tragic impacts of this cri current crisis but again I think we will see what does this mean for these findings in you know three five ten years time and what are the actions that need to be taken today to address the perception and the reality of uh, missed opportunity for young people and how can we engage them uh, in these important topics. Joanna, did you want to come in there? I mean, did, did you get any sense of why it is there's a higher lack of trust among younger people? Well, the interesting thing always uh, about a survey is it throws up more questions than answers. So what we have here is a rich empirical data. And what we would say to those who can then explore the data is unpack it and see what the context in is their own member state. But I think whilst it's obviously worrying that half of 16 to 29 year olds think low level uh, bribery or is acceptable in certain circumstances, as opposed to a third of the other age groups, a third or less of the older age groups. I think we also have to take heart though, that there's lots of positive things in relation to the results we got for young people. So again, amongst 16 to 29 year olds, far fewer of them, about a quarter of them thought that um, the only people to benefit from human rights are those who don't deserve them. So only a quarter of the youngest age group, but 65 plus year olds, it was about 40%. So I think we have to take heart that young people, there are a lot of movements maybe out there that they are not going through traditional political channels. So if we have conversations about uh, social media or the environmental movement, we can see a lot of um, positive uh, relationships with human rights with young people. But I think it's the question of one can look at the data and then you need to explore it and unpack it because it's the relationship between age and if you leave school early, the relationship between age and if you come from a more socially disadvantaged economic background. And we're talking about large segments of the general population. And it's again about delivering on rights. So if they have an acceptability for low level corruption, but it means then what kind of level of trust is there then in society? Do they trust the services to deliver on those rights? Do they see a future? So again, what is the relationship between youth and the state also delivering on 
basic uh, needs, are also their rights they're entitled to, and the relationship between that youth and the older generation, the public service in youth needs to be looked at. Michael O'Flaherty, I don't know if you want to come in there. I see you've joined us and you've, uh, you, I saw you nodding in that last uh, point. Um, what do you think of these, the findings so far and the, the responses here to them? Yeah, well, I've been following the debate very closely, and I wanted to come in specifically on the issue of young people. But Joe Goody more or less made the point I intended to make, but I'm going to make it again anyway, because I think it's important, which is let's not problematize young people. They're not the problem. And it would be really unhelpful to interpret these survey findings as saying that young people are an issue that's got to be solved. Uh, the problem is in an older generation, repeatedly letting down younger people. Uh, we've failed younger people. We know that from the way they responded on climate change. We look, look at the demographics out on the streets uh, against racism. It's, it's hugely predominantly young people, angry that society isn't, is, 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 isn't just and isn't looking after their future. Uh, uh, to the extent that's necessary. So we're the problem, not young people, even when we look at a figure like a willingness to give a bribe. Uh, if I could just come back though to two other issues in this current phase of the conversation. Uh, one is they, um, uh, I, I listened very closely to the mayor uh, and I thought it's so important to recognize and name the extent to which if we want respect for human rights in our societies, we have to have strong institutions. We have to invest in the architecture and indeed, that's why I, I'm so I, I'm so hopeful with the initiatives in the EU right now. For example, to strengthen its framework to uh, to monitor uh, and to engage on the rule of law across the EU member states. And then the last thing I want to say is, you, because people might say, why are you talking about corruption in a human rights discussion? But it, corruption is the most is the most pernicious blocker of access to our human rights. And it hasn't gotten enough attention, at least here in a European setting, we need to focus much more attention on corruption as a human rights problem. Thank you. Okay, thanks very much. Um, I have a, a question, it, it's not on my, my list, but um, it's, be, it's been touched on um, so far. And it was a key question, Joanna, that you asked, was our human rights just for some people and one thing it's true I mean I think it was in your question wasn't it are human rights just for or do the only people who benefit from them are criminals and or terrorists um, because although in some of the sections of this survey we've seen quite a geographic split that particular perception is there in every EU country, in some people, not in everyone, of course. But that strikes me as actually a really big problem if um, the, the argument, one, about universality seems to not, seems to be being lost in some sections of, of uh, society. Laura, maybe could I could I ask you about that? I mean, how do you bridge that? How do you bridge that gap? Even if the person's been horrible to you, that person has rights. You need to unmute yourself. It's difficult, and obviously, we still have to learn to do it more effectively. Um, we need to communicate better, and that's been touched upon many times. Um, how to inform people that they do have rights and what are those rights and how to enable them and support them to complain, um, to, to try to find uh, a support for uh, the rights that have been violated or, or they, they, can, they, they are not accessible. Um, we need to be much more on the field, talking to the people, as I said before, to try to, to come closer and to listen to their fears and not to judge them. Um, because we, we were, there's one example that I have from the field trip that we, we went to talk to local communities, uh, majority population, uh, but socioeconomically disadvantaged, to see those that live in far remote villages. Um, what are the challenges that they, they come across and how can we support them? Um, and by chance, it was 
a county which is on route for the migrants from Bosnia to Slovenia. We did not ask any questions about migrants. We were not interested in, in rights of migrants at that day, but just really wanted to see how social services, health services, infrastructure is accessible to mostly older population living in those remote areas. And it was half an hour, 45 minutes into the discussion when one of them said that they actually feel they need more police. They feel afraid because in the night you don't know if the dog is barking uh, because of the human or because of an animal. Is it a migrant or is it a thief? Uh, and they told us an example of an old lady who lived alone, alone in the village, something that used to be the village before. Uh, she fell asleep after the lunch. She took her afternoon nap. And when she woke up, there was an African man sleeping in the bed next to her. Imagine her fear. Imagine what she must have felt like. She's probably never saw a black man in, in her life. And now one was sleeping next to her in the bed. And they were very quick to tell me that, you know, nothing happened, nothing, nothing bad happened. It's just that she was so afraid. She actually offered him some food and, and, and they, they, he went his way with no harm done. But to address situations like that, which is the real life situation, uh, is to try to showcase that it's not about criminals and prisoners and migrants, but it's actually our neighbors that do have problems in, um, in, in accessing services, in realizing their human rights, that we need to listen to much better if we want to support and help them. Alexandra, do you want to come in there? I saw you nodding. I mean, Laura was talking about addressing fears. Is that something you also see as a challenge? Uh, well, um, I, I was nodding because I, I agree <laughs> very much. This is something, well, nowadays, probably, you know, we have a political campaign in Poland. Uh, just on Sunday, uh, we have a presidential election. And one of the topics uh, during the campaign um, uh, are the minorities, especially sexual minorities, uh, LGBT. Uh, but um, this is the crucial issue in our public discussion, not only in Poland, but also in Europe, that the human rights uh, is not only um, uh, regarding those um, migrants, those people who uh, come from different countries, have different faith, different sex, that this is something which deals every single person, myself, uh, not only neighbors, as uh, Laura has said, my, my mom, who is getting uh, older, though she's still very young, but getting older, and so on and so on. So this is the biggest issue, I think, uh, for the local authorities, regional author authorities, uh, our states, member states, but also for the, for the institution to change the view uh, of the human rights, not only regarding criminals, the rights in the prison and so on and so on. This is something which deals uh, with every single person, um, uh, every single person. And this is something what I really, uh, what I'm really trying to do every single day uh, in my city. Uh, but this must be something uh, more and more and uh, common. Thank you. Michael O'Flaherty, you did have your hand up at one point when, when Laura was speaking. So did you want to come yeah. in there? Yeah, thanks. Yeah, uh, this, uh, this finding we're discussing now is one of those which hasn't come as a surprise to anybody. We knew this stuff, uh, but what, we found out, we, what we've done now is validated uh, with, with, with the evidence. And it's, it's, a, it's a problem we've been struggling with for a few years. Uh, and I think we, we, we sort of know what's gone wrong. Uh, in the first place, the discourse of human rights comes up most commonly uh, in the courtrooms or around uh, people at the very edges of our societies. Lawyers will use human rights arguments to try and get the prisoner 
out. Um, when we talk about the situation on our frontiers, the treatment of migrants, we, we, the, we the specialists, we use the language of human rights. So if you're at home uh, getting, uh, getting your human rights news from the television or the radio or the newspaper, that's where you hear about human rights. And, uh, uh, and we have failed, as, as the other speakers have said, we have failed to get the person sitting on that sofa, listening, watching the TV, to recognize that human rights is also about them. But it's much harder uh, to correct this than maybe uh, uh, one typically acknowledges. Yeah, it's easy for me to say, like I did today, we must frame social justice, housing, healthcare, um, uh, 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 getting a job as issues of human rights. But we can do it, but it's very difficult to get our politicians and our policymakers and our public people to, to, to speak about these issues as human rights. Many reasons for that. One is, despite the fact that our countries have signed treaty after treaty, commitment after commitment, you will still find in, in, in politics people saying, this is, this, this, is, this is just policy stuff. Uh, uh, we're not going to use human rights language for this. Um, and we've got to work very, very hard on that. And the last thing I want to say, uh, is that while we've got to convince the person on the couch uh, watching the telly that human rights is also about him or her, we must never lose sight with very dangerous. If we say we must focus on the general population, never at the expense of the people at the edges and the margins. Human rights must still also be about the person locked up in a prison cell, whether we like that person or not. It must be about the migrant at our frontiers. So it's about getting, it's not losing anything while engaging again with, as I say, the person on the couch. Steve, can you help with the person on the couch though? Because we need them. <laughs> We do, we do need them. You're absolutely right. And um, I, I, I think perhaps now is that moment. I think it is the moment to seize that momentum. And um, yeah, as, as we come through this period of tremendous disruption, you know, both COVID-19 and now the Black Lives Matters protests and this almost awakening about some of these issues, I think yeah, our, our research with the Edelman Trust Barometer shows that um, government is the most trusted institution at the moment, which is a once in a lifetime finding in 20 years of data. We have this survey result for 20 years and as we now see almost across the world and certainly across many European uh, countries that government is the most trusted institution. So it, it is in that way and I, I know I talked about partnership a lot and I don't want to repeat that point but I think it is the moment really to act and it is the moment to seize that momentum and to um, engage the general population in what does this mean. I think we also saw that 61% of participants in one of our recent surveys said that they uh, understood that the recent uh, the pandemic had affected the most marginalized the most and that, that wasn't fair. So that there is that kind of resource to tap into in the general public in terms of an understanding that there is not fairness and that some things should change. And, you know, perhaps maybe more might change than we even feel comfortable with if we kind of uh, actually truly engage with some of these topics, which uh, are just so important. Important. And uh, yeah, I really do think it is the moment to do that. And as I said, I think the way, the way to do that is by working together with media, with government, with business and with NGOs, all pulling together, drawing on the best of each institution and uh, reaching that population and explaining uh, more about the role they can play in protecting rights. And in fact, holding people to uh, holding uh, authority to account in terms of delivering them. But I completely agree with the point that we also have to focus very deeply on those that are very hard to reach but yeah again I think it can be a win-win rather than something we have to do either or. Okay thanks very much. Now I did say that we would have possibly some questions online coming into this panel debate. We haven't had that many to be honest but we have one which is quite topical and that is how are you going to ensure, it's not really related to the survey, Joanna, but, but it's topical. Um, how do we ensure that the restrictions to rights imposed because of the pandemic are reasonable and limited and short term as possible? And I, I, it occurred to me this would be a good one to ask at this point, Steve, because you said your survey shows that trust in government is at a kind of a high. Is that post the pandemic? People turning back to 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 nurse if you like yeah you have uh 
exactly um set it out correctly there it's exactly it's exactly that we've seen a huge um swing in trust towards the institution of government during this pandemic we've done two surveys one in march and one very late in april to understand how this was progressing and uh, uh, coincidentally our annual survey had just um, issued its findings in january so we have a really good kind of track to be able to see there and you see a huge swing towards government and it's exactly that you know people are looking um for information they're looking for reassurance and they're looking to um, get through this pandemic and they're turning to government so it, 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 it's time really there for government to to respond and I said I don't think they can do it alone but they really must do it and it is the time to act now. Very interesting point then um, particularly maybe to Alexandra and to Laura and then Michael I think you may want to come in there. Um, we have actually invested a huge amount of trust in our public officials because of this pandemic. And we have allowed rights that we took for granted to be restricted uh, quite substantially in many cases and over a long period of time. So um, maybe to you first, Laura, how can countries, officials ensure that these are reasonable that you that you that you you know honor the trust that the public has has put in them unmute can i just go one step back mm -hmm. uh, before speaking about pandemic because there's something very important i don't think we've mentioned so far during today's discussion that that's the role of cso's non-governmental organizations and uh, traditionally, they are so involved and active, active in advocating and supporting rights of minorities, whether it's um, ethnic minorities, religious, sexual, whether it's migrants. Uh, but apart from direct service delivery, I don't think non-governmental organizations are so involved into advocating for socioeconomic rights. And correct me if I'm wrong, but I think that is something that we really need, we need to support CSOs so that they can support us in advocating better, not only towards the government about the importance of socioeconomic rights, but also informing people on the ground, those that need services and uh, uh, it's the way that they are informed. And I think the role of NGOs is extremely important. We shouldn't forget about it. Um, Briefly about the pandemic and the, the consequences it had, I think one thing that really comes to mind uh, that also I haven't heard mentioned so far in the discussions about it is the importance of investing in mental health services, because that is, uh, I think, an area in which a lot will need to be done so that we as societies um, can come out a bit healthier in, in all ways. Um, but um, looking back at the measures uh, restricting human rights, at least in Croatia, but I think also in some other countries, I think uh, what surprised me the most is that even some of the people that really had their hearts at right places and that were known to be human rights aware uh, were suddenly so afraid that they um, disregarded in a way the importance of the rule of law and the due process and the checks and balances that needs to be in place um, because of, of such a direct sudden and imminent threat to, to the health and even life. And I think that we need to really be very strong and persuasive in showcasing the importance of the due process and the rule of law, um, the constitutionality, the legality of the measures, the, the proportionality. Proportionality is something that's not so easy to understand. Uh, yeah, I think, well, sometimes it maybe takes a lawyer <laughs> to understand <laughs> it, not even that, uh, but it is important. I think it is important. Uh, uh, we need to hold, as, as always, we need to hold governments accountable uh, for that. We need to be open and allowed 
uh, and I think change is possible. I think we've, we've seen in Croatia some of the improvements in, in the process and in the legality of the measures that were imposed because uh, us as, as Ombuds and MHRI, but also civil society organizations and legal experts, constitutional law professors, uh, were very persuasive and loud in explaining to the decision makers and to the public of the importance of the human rights guarantees in imposing measures. Okay, thank you, Laura. Alexandra, can I ask you about specifically this idea that, you know, the public have invested more trust than, than usual in their public officials because of this crisis, this global public health crisis that we're in. Um, how do public officials ensure the powers they, they assumed are for this only and that people understand that this is, you know, as I think the head of the World Health Organization put it, temporarily loaning some rights to the government and that they are to be returned? Oh, well, first of all, thank you, uh, Laura, for all this, what you have said about uh, non-governmental um, sectors, uh, NGOs, uh, because this is the very important part of um, education about the human rights and, and fundamental rights. Um, and this is not really easy question to answer um, here in Poland. Um, therefore, um, we have a, a very tensive uh, political situation uh, in Poland. Uh, as you probably know, uh, we were supposed to have a presidential election on the 10th of May in a middle time of uh, outbreaking uh, ep ep epidemic numbers and so on and so on. And uh, many people in Poland uh, thought, um, maybe even more than they thought, uh, that uh, our government is using the trust people they have uh, that they can arrange the whole situation with the health and safety in our country uh, for the political fight uh, and uh, putting uh, uh, on the side our fundamental uh, rights. Uh, and this is a serious situation because when you are having as a purpose um, something what we really don't know what is happening all over the world we are not really very much um, sure aware uh, we don't have really very scientific uh, numbers uh, regarding uh, COVID, um, COVID-19 and when you are not 100% uh, sure that um, your public service, in a sense of central government, is um, um, putting your fundamental rights, human rights, on the side. Um, this is really dangerous situation. Um, and therefore, we are also having numbers showing the trust uh, to the local authorities and the central government. And during this um, health crisis um, for the past few months, three, four months, uh, we really can see uh, the uh, lower a trust to the central government and growing uh, trust to the local uh, authorities. For example, many mayors uh, of the cities, they were trying um, almost every single day to stay in touch with the people of the community and trying to uh, explain what is going on, what are the numbers, what we are trying to do uh, to take care of the people. We as uh, local leaders were supporting the hospitals and the medical services when the government um, didn't do it at the right time and so on and so on. Um, and so this is the crucial situation. I'm not really sure what will be the numbers um, and the and the answers of the people uh, in so that sort of survive next year. 
this is something what we could really see uh, if the people feel that they can mm, uh, put back their human rights. Uh, in a sense of fighting something what has um, a bigger influence to our everyday life. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Well, we're almost at the end of this debate. Uh, Joanna, I am going to come to you. Michael uh, Flaherty, I'm coming to you right now for your closing thoughts, and then I will hear the, the closing thoughts of each of the four panellists. But, Michael, uh, over to you. Thanks, Imogen. Not so much closing thoughts as reactions to what I've just heard. Uh, first, I love Steve's rallying cry. Um, he brought it all together. Uh, he put it better than any I ever could. But Steve, what you didn't mention was who's going to do all this rallying. It's great that we all get together to do all this necessary stuff, but we're going to have to be led. And I'd like to suggest, uh, Laura, that Ombudsman, National Human Rights Commissions, you're in a, you play a critical role here. You can be the energy that pulls it all together at the national level. Uh, and and I, frankly, I think if you don't do it, it won't happen. Um, now, back to COVID and the restriction of our rights. Um, we're following that really closely at the Fundamental Rights Agency. And we're, I think I said earlier, we're publishing a monthly bulletin. The next one will be out next week on the human rights dimensions of how the crisis is panning out. And um, as you'd expect, we're, we're worried about quite a lot of what we see. Um, we're worried, for example, that um, just to take two examples, uh, that uh, tracing apps are being developed everywhere right now. But in many places, it's not on the basis of law. And you need a legal base to uh, intrude on people's rights, like privacy rights. Um, children, uh, some of the impact on children is very worrying from a human rights point of view. Distance learning, if you're a Roma child without access to the internet. Distance learning, if you come from a poor family that relied on school meals. So there's a lot of human rights issues at stake. And here again, my suggestion. Um, it's that we need to put human rights experts at the heart of the decision making. In most of our countries now, there's some committee that's advising the government and the governments are largely following the advice. There are epidemiologists, economists, security people and others in those committees. Very few of them have a human rights expert. So put human rights experts in at the heart of the decision making so that the limits on the restriction of rights are fully respected so that the unintended consequences are identified. And I'm going to stop with uh, Laura again, because I think who would you put in these committees? You should be putting the national human rights institutions in there, the ombudsmen, the commissions. And I think that if we it's still not too late. We have months yet to go in this story. So put them in now. Thank you. Thank you very much. Well, I think that's, uh, you said, rallying cry from Steve. It's a rallying cry from, from you as well, Michael O'Flaherty. Just before we, we finish for today, I'd like to ask each of our four panellists just a little maybe summing up. And we'll start with you, Joanna. Um, what finding perhaps concerned or surprised you most from this survey? And what, since you're from the Fundamental Rights Agency, what would you propose doing about it? Well, to some extent, as I've already mentioned, it's this some surprising results in relation to the age disparities in results. So whilst there's some fantastic results for young people, there are also some worrying results. So I say if we're going to focus on something, maybe that's a group going forward that we really also need to uh, put our attention on. Besides the rich data that we have on the diversity of what we call the general population. So I think whilst we've referred to the general population, we're all different ages, different incomes, etc. The group speaking here today, we're all very much of a similar background. I hope we all believe in fundamental rights, for example. So I would say that taking the results, it's really the, the clear message that we have. And we have seven opinions attached uh, to uh, this report, seven very clear opinions for, for action, is that we would really like uh, ombuds offices, member state governments, institutions to take those findings and to work with them to say, how do we need to work with the general population in all their diversity to make sure that we don't have responses if we go forward in years where we see there is not the buy-in level for certain aspects of human rights that we would like to see because people don't feel served by the state. There's a lot of positivity in the results too. We can take um, a huge um, 
positive sense of people do believe in fair societies. But the other side, if it's not delivering for them and they're struggling, that needs to be addressed. It takes us back to socioeconomic rights. And I think with COVID, it's really taken us all back to the need to address some of these huge issues when it comes to the more disadvantaged in society. Steve, you're next. Again, briefly, your closing thoughts, you know, which finding did you find particularly striking and what would you propose doing about it? Yeah, I, I think for, for me, the finding I, I find the most striking is um, this sort of parallel world that people are living in where um, they're not seeing the importance of human rights or the applicability of it to um, their day-to-day -day life and we come back to then to the man and woman on, on the couch that general public question about what can we do to engage audiences in this question of human rights to help them understand why they matter and through that to sort of drive further change and drive further attention on them th through government and through the other institutions so I guess that earlier point about partnership but also about don't underestimate the power that the sort of the, the lay citizen can um can play in driving this change in the long term if we can engage them in the topic itself alexandra um for me uh, one number a uh, little bit um on the on the on the edge but what was really important to me importance to democracy that the rights of minority groups are protected by country and uh, this average number uh, for the European Union is 66, uh, for, uh, but for my country, for Poland, is 71. It means uh, that um, our everyday job, our, I also take uh, into consideration activists, non-governmental organizations, uh, showing that the inclusion uh, that the giving access to everyone to public services to everyone is important for saving the democracy is something um, what is really uh, um, important to me and it shows that um, even though sometimes we have a lot of obstacles we're on a good way and we need to continue this no matter uh, what will happen again with the COVID uh, situation or so on or so on. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Laura, then your thoughts, summing up. Thank you. Well, I first of all need to thank Michael for his kind words. Uh, but as you know, we are often ignored and even threatened for speaking out the ugly truth. Uh, as, as ombuds and HRIs and equality bodies and commissioners that I'm think it all going bottom up and top to bottom is a process uh, that we all have something to contribute to. And I think this server will be of enormous uh, um, benefit. So thank you once again for that. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you to all our panelists. Michael, did you want to say a final couple of words before we finish? Sure, just very briefly. Um, I echo what we've heard from just about everybody. Two things I take away from today and from the survey. First, believe in people. Uh, the, we reaffirm through this survey the fundamental decency that's out there in, their society, in our societies. But side by side with believing in people and in their fundamental decency deliver for them, we've got to invest ever more in equality and in social justice. Uh, and if we engage people by this pathway, then we can bring human rights to life for the whole of our society. Okay, thank you very much to all of our panelists from your time and the really fascinating insults. Thank you especially to Fundamental Rights Agency for what I think is going to be a really important survey. I mean, not just for us to discuss it today, but as a tool over the, in the coming months and years for people involved in human rights, whether they're in government or in NGOs or indeed in, in business. Don't forget that we've got another panel, same time, same place tomorrow, where we're going to look specifically at data technology and human rights in the context of public health crises. So yes, the app, we're going to be talking about that. We've got some great guests from Microsoft. We've got the European Data Protection Supervisor. We've got somebody from the World Health Organization. So that will be kicking off at 10 o'clock tomorrow morning. In the meantime, we will leave you with just a few more reactions from different human rights activists and public figures across Europe to this survey. 
Thank you again to Croatia and to Norway for supporting this event. And thank you to all of you for joining us. I thought that would be a good backdrop to say something about the survey. The survey talks about human rights being under threat. The findings being a wake-up call. Strong words, what can we do? The data also show a very large majority favoring human rights. There are, of course, a number of people more skeptical, but they're a minority. It's really a question of silent majority versus loud minority. That's a very good starting point. We need, as human rights professionals, to help verbalize what the majority in our society wants. How can we do that? I'm a huge fan of what the FRA does with its fundamental rights communication work. We need to apply that to this data. We need to help unsilence the majority. What struck me the most in this report is that half of the young people across Europe seem to be willing today to resort on low-level bribery, such as giving a favor or a gift to a public authority in order to receive a particular service, be it medical or administrative. This finding epitomizes the slippery slope our European societies are making these days. We individually and collectively accept to trade money and favors for convenience. Yet corruption affects each and every of us and uh, favoring a patient over another, educating a citizen over another one means to make our society and ourselves poorer. To change that, uh, the good lobby strives to equalize access to power by popularizing the many avenues of participation that enable Enable everyone to constructively interact with decision makers and ultimately holding them in, uh, into account. Time has come to lobby for change. We welcome this report that highlights once again that for us persons with disability, a lot of European countries do not enough to inform people of their rights. Information is also only useful when we can act on it. We need accessibility, we need countries to dismantle residential institutions where disabled persons are deprived of their rights to live independently in the community with the adequate support they need. Above this, they need to proactively guarantee our rights. And also the system of claiming our rights is so complicated that it's discouraging us. And even when people complain, they feel that not enough is done to redress and to prevent for the future. So the need to truly improve public and private services and support is crucial for us to lead an independent life in the society on equal level as all other European citizens, without having to fight constantly for our rights. Thank you. Hello, my name is Mary. I am a Spaniard and during the COVID-19 pandemic, I work in the front line as an assistant nurse. Earlier in my life, I benefit from the Don Bosco Social Services where I have experience the respect given to minorities in my country. However, there are many people who doesn't uh, enjoy this human rights completely in Spain, uh, especially during the pandemic. Even more people, not only minority, had no salaries, no social benefits, lack of access to healthcare, and children having access to education because the digital gap. For this reason, Don Bosco Social Services has provided for the first time a food program support and about computer and devices and developed education activities with children and families in extreme need. President of the European Youth Forum, what struck me most to read in the report was that young people seem to pay less importance to certain factors of democracy. But I think it's also important that we look into the bigger picture, because we also know that while conventional politics might not work for young people, we are also at the forefront of youth movements driving our society for change. So what should we do to really allow young people to fully engage politics? I have three suggestions. The first one would be that we finally need to start talking about 
topics that are interested and of concern for young people. Secondly, we should lower the voting age to 16. And thirdly, we must ensure that political education is also part of the school curriculum. So these are my three suggestions to really youth up our society. A finding I found challenging, if not surprising, in the Fundamental Rights Agency survey is that a full third of Europeans believe that the only people who benefit from human rights are those who don't deserve them, such as criminals or terrorists, and that that number goes up to 44% amongst those who find it difficult to make ends meet. To me, that illustrates a fundamental failing in terms of how we've engaged with people around rights. We need to move beyond legal abstractions to really illustrate in concrete terms that human rights are the lifeblood of our day-to-day -day existences, that they're the backbone of our jobs, of our housing, of our education, and that they're part of what's keeping us safe during this pandemic. That a rights-respecting society is one that will afford greater benefits for all people and their children going forward, that it will make us all safer and more secure, even when those rights are being afforded to people who are accused of crimes or accused of terrorism. To me, the most striking finding of this report is the perceived discrepancy between human rights ideals and political practice and implementation. Nearly nine out of 10 people in the EU find that human rights are important for creating fairer societies, whereas six out of 10 people find that politicians do not care about them. And this perception is all the more prevalent among the socially disadvantaged. This points to a need for politicians in the EU to better demonstrate their commitment to human dignity, equality, and non-discrimination, not least in socioeconomic terms. The socioeconomic impact of the pandemic, recent protests against racism also here in the EU, as well as the urgent need to shift the global economy towards sustainability, points to an urgent need for us all to overcome the discrepancies that this report points to. Judiciary is one of the three pillars of a democratic state. Executive power, legislative power, and judiciary have to control each other without dominating each other. However, it's a fact that the legislative power and executive power have become more intertwined and the executive power has grown. This brings with it an imbalance. It is now an alarming signal to read that one out of four EU citizens has the impression that a judge rarely or never does a job out of influence from the government. This not only shows lack of trust, but also a lack of structural independence of our systems, not only in those systems which are anyway in the spotlight, unfortunately. We have to stand up to protect our independence. We have to stand up to disclose structural deficits, and we have to stand up for our European colleagues in need. My major concern with the results of this year's Fundamental Rights Survey is about political intimidation and independence of the judiciary. The results are striking. 21% of the people in the European Union think that NGOs and charities are never or rarely able to do their work free from government intimidation, and 27% believe that judges are never able to do their job free from government influence. The findings of the survey fully support our observations from the past several years in my own country, Bulgaria, and in several other East European states. The EU should take these unfortunate developments very seriously and should deal with them through a series of monitoring, legislative, and financial measures. Europe cannot take pride of its democratic culture and promote it outside of its borders if it is unable to address these serious problems within member states. What I find important about this research is that it confirms that society isn't just divided into two groups of people who are pro-human rights and anti-human rights. What the research results suggest is that actually a lot of people have conflicting views about human rights. 
Sometimes they're in favour of human rights and sometimes they're against them. And this group actually seems to be the biggest group in society. We need to do two things about this. First, we need to find out much more about this movable middle. How is it that they think about human rights? What is it that they are worried about? And the second thing that we need to do is to learn to communicate much more effectively than we are at the moment. So we need to know how to speak about human rights in a way that resonates with people's values. Authoritarians have been doing this very effectively for quite a number of years. We need to play catch up.